Yeah, it's it's again. I mean, I'll I'll start it really by. Um, I think you know if I if I say they found it difficult, you know, of course, what I don't want to do is I don't want to compare that difficult to to what a lot of people are going through at this moment in time. You know, of course, there's varying degrees of that. You know, I'm talking about people that perhaps have not been affected in, in, in any way. And we know, obviously, some of our fans have been affected by it and their families. So, so first of all, our sort of hearts go out to them and our support with them. But uh, the players, I think, have been different different degrees, really. I think some of the players have just got on with it and, and uh, you know, slightly different to the off-season in terms of, you know, you're not really relaxing you're not really sort of uh, in between seasons um you know you haven't got much else to do so actually the engagement in terms of going out and doing their physical work has been very very good because i think the players have actually enjoyed getting out and doing it um and i think most of the players have found that you know mentally a, a relief um, to go out for just an hour and focus on something else for an hour rather than being in the house i think one or two of the players have found it found it quite hard found it quite tough found it difficult or a little bit more difficult to be motivated because um, in the same way that we've all found in some ways, I mean, I've sat down to watch a few of the games um, on our opponents and it's quite difficult to watch football when you don't know when, you know, without a real view to, to, you know, if it's two weeks away a game and you know you've got to prepare for it, it's very, very different to potentially being eight, nine, ten weeks away from a game. So. So I think it's been a little bit of a challenge in that sense. Uh, I think we've all missed, you know, again, we've all missed football. It's a fabulous sport. Um, we've all missed uh, games at the Den and the fans and, and that engagement that you have with them. Um, and I think from that point, you also realise how much football, you know, the thought of playing football without fans, I think at that point is you kind of realise just how important the fans are. You know, I'm not, I'm not just saying we obviously know they're important, but you kind of realise they are basically the game because without the fans, it's kind of it's, it's not a great proposition, is it? So, so, um, so, so loads of things. I think most people are coping pretty well, but um, as as I'm sure the rest of society, the odd person struggling um, with it because you know their day to day living has, has changed. Yeah, no, I don't see it being affected at all. I think it probably will strengthen it, if anything. I mean, a lot of the stuff we've done uh, to try and keep the group together, a lot of group chat stuff. Um, you know, we've been putting videos on of the players' clips um, just to see, for them to feel like footballers still, for them to appreciate the, the ability of the teammates, to build that kind of trust in each other. Um, so there's been many things that we've done to try and keep that alive. and. And um, what's been what's been really really amazing is you know I've been spoke to all the players how desperate they are to get back how how looking forward to getting back they are how much they've missed the interaction with the teammates and, and, and the fans um, so I, I don't see that a problem I think in, 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 if anything I think that will be strengthened and uh, and also you know the way the clubs reacted and the way the fans have reacted I think that will also strengthen um, the bond that I think everyone's got already to the club. Uh, Tom, I spoke to uh, PT this morning um, and at the moment he's doing really, really well. Again, I'm sort of reticent to, to give too many sort of dates and targets um, because obviously we've been there before with Tomo and he had a little bit of a setback. The, the general consensus is that when we go back to training, if that's May the 16th, which is a date the AFL have given us of the latest day, whether that remains in place, uh, I think Tomo should be able to join in with, with certain exercises and certain sessions. So. Um, I think that's a, that's a huge positive for us. I think Frank Fielding also will probably be able to engage in some activities, maybe not quite as quick as Tomo. So, so I think for those two, you know, both of them won't be a million miles away. I think Tom is probably slightly ahead. Um, oh wow! Well, I think it has to be this. It has to be this scenario. I think everything up until now uh, been pretty smooth. Um, so I think that I think the first challenge we had to face was was to, to change the away form and to try to turn the away form around, which I saw as a massive, a massive obstacle in our progression this season and certainly progressing, you know, in in the in the sort of back half of the season, which is obviously when we've come in. And then of course this scenario now, which you know we haven't been at the club that long. So therefore you still have to have that trust of the play. You know, I think if you've been a manager for three or four years at one club, and this happens, and you've got a much stronger, closer relationship with your players. You know, it's probably a little bit easier to 
to maintain that. But for me, of course, that's something we've tried to actually build that relationship a little bit and strengthen strengthen that relationship. And and um, so I, w- I would say those two challenges really. But beyond the pitch, one was the away form. The off the pitch one, of course, has been now just keeping the players engaged and and uh, understanding a little bit more about their personalities and character. And, and uh, like I said, at the moment, certainly off the pitch, they've uh, they've been exemplary in terms of their attitude and their mentality. Um, I, I think there's probably a couple. I think I'll probably go for the second one, but the first one would probably be the the first game against Stoke, the home game, because it's always funny when you when you first manage a game um, in front of your home crowd, in front of your new team crowd. Um, you want it to go so well and you want people to be excited a little bit with, with what maybe is to come. It's always hard to do that because you haven't had long to work with the players. Um, but nevertheless, I think that first game against Stoke to win it and play so well and maybe do one or two different things with the way we went about it um, was a really nice moment. But probably the, the actual moment, I would say probably the not just because they're rivals or not just because they're a local team, but probably the winner against Charlton, I would say. Um, just because it was a game that actually Charlton had played pretty well in. We actually, you know, we didn't dominate the game. Um, we didn't play that fantastically well. We had some issues in it. Um, but the players maintained that belief. And, and that goal, I think, told me as a manager, you know, what a strong group we had. And, you know, this is a group that maybe it's going to lack a little bit of quality at times. Maybe it's going to lack a little bit of control but it's not going to lack a work ethic and a belief in each other. And I think those, you know, those moments are quite important to a manager. I thought he going to talk about my goal again, Bill, there, when I was 17. <laughs> can, I, can I mention that again or not? Is that you can. Now? You can. Oh, right. Okay. Well, I talk about my winner that I scored at the old den then. I was, no, I was 17. It's my first game uh, for Cambridge. Um, it's quite an interesting story if anyone doesn't know it, but uh, the goal is on YouTube somewhere if, if anyone wants to try and find it. Um, so just to, at least to prove I'm not lying. Uh, I came on after 25 minutes, it was under John Beck, obviously kind of an infamous Cambridge team at the time. Um, and I scored the winner to make it 2-1 after about 65 minutes, which was a header that stuck in the stanchion, which is probably one of the best goals I've ever, I haven't scored many, but it was one of my best goals I think even now. Um, and just as I was getting really euphoric about it and thinking about this great career that I might have at 17, I got brought off 10 minutes later. So the sub got subbed, um, which was in- incredibly embarrassing and, and, and humbling. Um, but I think it was also a good indication of a manager and how a manager's brain works, because I think he was trying to teach me a little bit of a lesson and not to get too high. So, so that was that one. I think as a manager, I'm not, I don't not actually manage that many times in the but I remember bringing Derby down here and felt, felt like we played really, really well as a Derby team. It was a game, I just remember how hard it was um, to come to to, uh, to the den and how hard it was to actually beat a Millwall side. No matter how well you play, it just, they just wouldn't go away. They just wouldn't back down. So, so um, And I think you, you remember those moments and I think you try to use them, certainly as a manager. You know, you, you don't want to lose that feeling of of toughness and mentality and, and a hard place to come and play as much as we want to kind of improve and, and um, vary the style, I think, as, as we go along. Yeah, we look everywhere. I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've come from sort of, you know, being a manager at Burton where, you know, I would go and watch, on a Wednesday night, I would go and watch Alfreton, um, which is, you know, probably the equivalent of, of watching the likes of Bromley, the likes of Dartford, you know, go into those sort of games. Most clubs might thank me, not thank me for that, to be honest, because Alfreton is quite a small club. But, but, um, but you know, I used to love going to those sort of games, and that was like Conference North at the time. Got a couple of clubs around me that are, that are um, you know, probably three or four divisions below that, that I'll go and watch. And you watch it, you watch, you watch every player, every level, every league that you think that you can get an advantage from, you know, to, to, to sign players. So. Uh, certainly, the foreign market's a market that we're trying to use, we're trying to look at for the value, and also the lower leagues, you know, particularly in the current situation, because of course, there's going to be a lot of teams down there that are going to you need, need to sell some of those assets, you know, to keep themselves going. So, so I think, you know, there's not, there's not really any level that we don't look at, um, but I think it's hard, it's getting harder to find lower league players in my experience just because 
there's so many clubs looking, you know, whereas once in a while you could go to a game on a Wednesday and see a player, but maybe some players, some people have seen, there's so much media now and so much coverage that it's hard for a player to go unnoticed um, at that level. Uh, but we still would watch players at, at that level and, and below and above. Right, I'm going to go for probably, I'm just going to go for a very obvious one. I think someone like Teddy Sheringham, um, who just had the quality, you know, so I think he had he had a lot of those Millwall attributes in terms of, you know, he's good in the air, you know, he wasn't physically weak, um, but yeah, he just had that little bit of extra class and extra composure. And I think that, you know, they're sort of, they're the, they're the combinations that we're looking for in the players. You know, we want the players to have that, that Millwall kind of, DNA, if you like, but we also want that technical ability as well. So, so to, to, to have someone like a Teddy sharing and playing either as a ten or a nine in the current team, I think would be um, would be a massive, massive signing for us. God knows how much he'd cost nowadays. He'd be a lot. Well, he wouldn't now because he's obviously a bit older. But at his pomp, I'm sure he'd be well worth a good few million. God knows. <laughs> I think with I think with Coops and. I mean, if you think about the sort of, the, probably the best they've done it, I think, is the Preston game. And, um, you know, if you look at switching to a 5-2-3, um, I think we played it quite well. And we, I think we went to, went to Dart. I think, we, if you look at the games, we went to Swansea. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to bore everyone now with a little bit of an introduction, just so it didn't sound um, unthought of the answer. So, if you think about a Swansea game, if you think about a Bristol game, you know, we, we, we'd had possession, we played well, we'd been defensively strong. Um, and then, you know, sometimes when you when you play the formation a little bit more, sometimes you think, okay, so teams have worked out certain aspects of it. Now, how can we cause them even more problems? And the problems, I think, were always um, about getting Coops and Hutchie to to step a little bit forward, a bit more freedom, and join in. And when you watch them in training, it's interesting because when I watched them before, you know, I've seen Coops in those big diagonals, and I've seen Coops. Um, you know, defending really, really well on Hutchie the same. But actually, when you watch them in training and you watch them very closely, they can actually handle the ball. You know, a lot of these players can handle the ball and, they're, they're, you know, they're actually fairly comfortable on the ball. So, so we just tried to give them a little bit of license. I remember that game uh, against Preston. We just give them a bit of license. said, look, just go, just go, just keep going. Don't stop. You know, if you feel like you can keep going, we've got plenty of players behind the ball um, that can give us defensive security. So, so and I think they've actually enjoyed it. I think we've worked on it in training. We've done a lot of drills in training to try and encourage it. Um, and I think the more they've done it, the more they've believed they can do it. And probably the likes of Coops doing it, there's an element of surprise, isn't there? You know, you don't often see a six foot six defender galloping forward playing one twos with people. You know, so I think he probably surprised the opposition as much as he surprised me on the bench, and, and probably you sat in the stands, Bill, um, in terms of how composed he was when he did it. I think I'd have to go for right. What sandwich am I go for? I'm going to go for a. I'm going to go quite basic. I'm going to go chicken and stuffing sandwich, followed by salt and vinegar crisps. Does that extend to them kettle chips? Because I look quite like them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we can do that, can't we? And what drink would I have? Well, obviously can't be alcoholic, can it? Um, I'd probably just go for water. Incredibly boring, but I'm not a big fizzy drink fan either. So, so yeah, that's probably what I'd go for. It's got to go in the fridge, and surely it's a health risk if you use it and then just leave it in the cupboard. I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to have a look in there. I can't. I can run to the kitchen quickly now if you want, but it's probably. Oh, I just wonder what it says in the back. Does it say store in a store in a dry room or some whatever it is store in a cupboard one sort as they say refrigerate when open we've got to go by the experts surely i think listen if you pete look if you if you pete if you're an eating pizza the night before it's basically cold then it ain't gonna matter whether the ketchup's cold either is it so I, i'm going fridge i don't like ketchup just to add but i'm gonna go fridge fridge all day long chocolate with a little bit of bite Chocolate with a bit of bite in it. Who likes melted, oh, soft chocolate, warm, soft melted chocolate, that's disgusting. Chocolate with a bite in it, little whole nut dairy milk, can't beat it. That is, that is, every Saturday night in my house, we have to, we get the chocolate out, out of the fridge. We get the chocolate out of the fridge, Bill, and we have a little munch up for about half an hour.
Well, I mean, there's an obvious problem here because a penguin, well, we're, hang on, we're talking emperor penguin or what type of penguin? I'm a bit of a sort of national geo, but I'd like to know what type of penguin it is. Like, is it a big penguin or a small penguin? Big one. Let's go average size penguin. Average size penguin, right, okay. Uh, well, the problem is a penguin's quite big. It looks quite heavy. So it's all right having men's feet, but it's quite a lot of bulk on top in there. But um, but then you wouldn't want penguins' feet because they're not the quickest, are they? And it's on land, this race, is it? Or is it in the water? No, it's on Just land. Check it. uh, I'm going man's feet and a penguin body. Um, that's what I'm going. Because Actually, it's a stupid question because when you think about it, what good's a man's upper half if you've got penguins' feet? Do you know what I mean? Who's that? Who's that? Bill, who's asked that question? What fans asked that question? Of all the things they could, could have asked me the most insightful question in the world. And somebody has sent that in, but I like it. It's thinking out of the box. Oh, hello. Hello, so, watch my Sky interview, did they? Listen, I'd like to ask a question out there. Does any man have any say in anything that goes in their house? Because if I'm, I'll be really honest, I haven't. I haven't. I don't know if you can see behind me, there's two Manager of the Month awards. That's basically all I've got to show for my whole life and my whole career. So, um, never read it, don't know. Would love, to, I should have got my book collection in because it's slightly, I think it's slightly more impressive, but, but um, no. I, 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 uh, would you read Would you read Lady, Lady Gaga's biography? So even if someone gave you it, I don't know if I would. Would you? Hang on, where is it? It's behind there somewhere. Coco Chanel, Chanel, fashion book. There you go. Do any of them look, they don't look like they're mine, do they, in fairness? So I've got no idea, but uh, I love, love, the, um, love the fact that he noticed. <laughs>